On the last episode of Dark Coast, we picked up where episode one and two had left us off, towards the end of week one of our two-week expedition to Area A, with a research team consisting of Alaskan Bigfoot investigator and retired police officer Larry Beans Baxter, Bigfoot researcher and drone pilot Damon Irons, and crew member Luca. In this last episode, we did not experience any significant unusual activity, but did have some encounters with other known animals, such as hearing humpback whales breaching in the water at nearly 3 a.m., which sounded like a large, watery explosion in the distance. Oh, yeah. We also continued to explore the valley across the bay from us, which is where in episode 2 we discovered large undefined footprints pressed into much of the moss, as well as finding an old and unusual cabin tucked far up on the hillside. On day 6 of the expedition, while surveying the site of a previous cabin we had discovered last year, we noticed what looked like bear damage to the side of a shed, but also large tufts of interesting looking hair or fur. We figured it was likely from a bear, but decided to collect it anyway, just in case, in order to send it out later for analysis so we could get a better idea of what it could be. After collecting the hair sample, we continued our work with the thermal drone, surveying the shadowy valley around us, being able to identify two Sitka blacktail deer, as well as a porcupine in a tree. Aside from the one deer we spotted with the drone on day number two, these were the first examples of wildlife we had seen all week long with the drone, so this was a good sign overall. As mentioned in previous episodes, Sitka blacktail deer are technically not supposed to be in this area of the Kenai Peninsula, according to Alaskan authorities, so this was an example of how wildlife simply do as they please, and do not fit neatly into the boxes we put them in. It also says something about the vast wilderness of this area and the ability of wildlife to move freely without much detection from area to area. As the first week of the expedition wrapped up, Damon and Luca would be heading home and we would be exchanging them for researcher Rebecca Slick of the Olympic Project. So, morning number seven, getting ready to head out to take these guys fly out. Damon. We're very sad. Yeah. I'm super sad. But uh, we're gonna leave some, we're gonna have a camera underneath the cabin, right? While we're gone? Yeah, I'm excited about that. I, I don't know if we're gonna be gone long enough to, to raise some curiosity for something right. to come down and check out the cabin, but I've put it in a pretty sweet spot. I think it's relatively undetectable <clears throat> and it's right under the area where we found the handprints so hopefully yeah. we're going to be gone almost all day if not all day uh so hopefully something will come down to check out the cabin to see if anybody's around and uh if anything we'll get a shot of some legs walking by yep i'm going to set up a audio recorder right now on the deck and just have that run pretty much as long as the battery goes so we're going to set that up and then see what happens hopefully the cycle repeats and something decides to come out here all right setting up the audio recorder right now put it in a dry bag and just leave it hanging here and just let it run okay audio is rolling going into the dry bag so it'll hang out Hang it right up here. So it should put the mic pointed out. It should be 
Claudio should be out that in, in that direction. So. Damon, you're leaving with a souvenir. What do you got there? Absolutely. It's uh, many pounds of halibut. Yeah, you got a bunch awesome of halibut. Awesome catch earlier, yeah. Nice. Yeah. This works. Yeah, what a weird fish this thing is. Big halibut. Luca, what do you think, leaving? Yeah, I mean, it's sad. It's always sad to leave someplace. Good times? Yeah, great times. All right, let's get you home. Most of that day was spent driving to and from Anchorage, but we needed to get back to Area A as quickly as possible due to bad weather incoming on the ocean. I got interested in Bigfoot a few years back, about 10 years ago. Um, wasn't really that into it, and then went through a time in my life where I needed a distraction. Just really started reading, and thankfully the books I came across when I was interested in it were the good, the good books, like Dr. Meldrum's book, uh, Dr. Bindernagel, John Green, Grover Krantz, those kind, and then some other names, but really was diving into some of the good, I think some of the good books. And there were some case, um, books on case cases, different sightings, um, just really interesting. And I was living in Pennsylvania at the time, got a chance to come out to Washington and fell in love with it, eventually ended up moving there and got involved with the Olympic project. And that opened up some doors meeting some really cool people who are really good friends and eventually got to be a, uh, an investigator with the BFRO. I'm not as active in that right now because there's been other things going on. We had previously worked with Rebecca and much of the Olympic Project crew while visiting them on Washington's Olympic Peninsula in 2021. This included a visit to the so-called nest site they have been studying for a number of years. You can see some of this in our film On the Trail of Bigfoot, The Discovery, as well as one of the earliest Beyond the Trail films titled Olympic Bigfoot, seen here on YouTube. With Rebecca being a seasoned Sasquatch field researcher, she was a logical choice to join us for part of the expedition. Ever since the stories of the strange baby crying noises emanating from this location, in association with women visiting, we had wanted to bring out female researchers in hopes that it might take place again. I'll back up a little bit and explain for those who might be unaware of what I'm talking about. When I first began communicating with the property owner Scott back in 2021, nearly a year prior to our first visit to Area A in May of 2022, he had sent me a variety of intriguing audio recordings they had captured on location. While much of these have been covered already in both the Alaskan Coastal Sasquatch from last year and the first episode of this series from back in August, here are a few of those clips.
Most of these were somewhat ape-like in nature, sort of the typical alleged Sasquatch-like audio. But there was one recording unlike the rest, which sounded like some sort of crying noise. So the first year I kept a journal, and I made an entry while loading materials on the beach, heard what sounded like a baby crying in the woods, and I just wrote weird. While it is intriguing to me, it is not conclusive proof of anything. I've heard various theories from others about what animal could explain the baby crying audio. Some have suggested a fox, despite their presence on the Kenai Peninsula being very rare. Others have said perhaps an otter or even a porcupine. While I can't discount any of those, I have yet to find a close match to any known animal with this audio. That doesn't mean it's not possible to do, however, as wildlife can produce unique sounds that will differ from known recordings. I welcome any theories or suggestions in the comments below, or social media, or via email, if you have any explanation to offer. The more intriguing element of this audio is that according to Scott, it has only been heard a couple of times, and on each of those occasions, it was when women happened to be present on the property. It's only when women are out here. It's never, we've, we haven't heard it. It's only when women are out here. It's, it's just a strange thing. Statistically speaking, with the amount of trips Scott and his companions have made to this location over the years, one would expect that they would have heard this sound on at least more than a few occasions. With the vast majority of trips out there being primarily men, why is it that this strange sound has only ever been heard on the few occasions women have been there? That certainly raised some questions for me. This strange baby crying story stood out in particular. In the culture of the Tlingit people of Southeast Alaska, there is a story of the Kushtaka, or Otter Man, which is described as a hairy man-like creature. The Kushtaka was described as emitting a crying sound in order to lure women towards them. Thinking about that further made me wonder about the stories of the Kushtaka actually being a Sasquatch swimming, as there have been reported sightings of these creatures swimming between channels on Vancouver Island, British Columbia, and even in Southeast Alaska. We figured it would be interesting to see if during the rest of this week, the presence of a female researcher in the mix would have any effect on potential activity. I do reserve the right to run back to the cabin if we hear the baby crying. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> well, maybe that'll get someone's attention. Yeah, I'll be like, okay, your hypothesis is true, <laughs> and I'm going inside. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, that was really cool. I've never, Isn't that I've gotten to do echo? that in different places, and I never got that echo or yeah. that. It's that like an amphitheater. Yeah. Scott says, the whole place is like an amphitheater. And that's what's so difficult when you hear a noise, especially if you're down at the cabin, it's hard to tell which direction it's coming from. Like when I heard that mystery gunshot, I don't know if it was behind me or in forward. I mean, it sounded like it was from behind me. Do you think it could have been up here, but it echoed down there and bounced back at you? It's possible. I mean, it sounded Something like- Something up on that hill It sounded, well, the hill, that's, the the hill that's up there is even bigger than this one. That's where Scott says he hears the hollow baseball bat sound from more often. Hmm. Hoping they come back and... Yeah. Well, that's the first feminine sound, right? You guys have been doing all kinds yeah, of... Yeah, we've been doing all kinds of st stupid human, <laughs> human male noises.
Maybe that'll, uh, like I said, soften our presence a bit. No pressure. <laughs> Was that a bird? I'm not sure, because it was... It's just far enough away, it's hard to tell. I know. But it's shrieky. So it could be so a shore mm -hmm. bird, but it doesn't quite sound like it's a gull. I mean, it could be some kind of... You got a lot of sea ducks up here. I just thought that was really, I thought that could have well, been the preamble. I immediately went to yeah, the, the baby. Yeah. <laughs> Is that the direction you can hike up higher? Yeah, I mean, I'm the short, I like the shortcut, which takes it over here. You go up on the ridge. It's a bit of a, I mean, it's not a haul, but it's doable. But does anything go? Yeah, there's that? a trail. We'd have to go back down towards the cabin and then go up the old logging road to get up that hill. Okay. The shortcut is this way, because I, I have a path that's like a runoff path, and that takes us right to our camp over there. I just was trying to get an idea of... Yeah, because the camp, like I said, at some point, even if we don't end up staying up there, we will have to go get those tents and bring all that stuff back, because oh, I need right. to bring my tent back, and then I want to leave Scott's stuff, and it's just going to be wet all week up there. If we hear that again, now I hadn't set audio out yet because I was going to do it before bed. Did anybody else have it running right now? No, the only thing to be running is the songbird. Oh, I thought, okay. Me, I don't think Beans did. I had my audio running today, but the battery was dead and okay. I didn't switch it before we left. Okay. I had it running while we were gone all day because... Yeah. Well, no, because you weren't here yet. Our theory is that a lot of stuff happens when nobody's around. That's why Beans had that camera under there, and that's why I left the audio out. That was weird. I mean, I don't know. It could be a bird, because yeah. it got close, and then it was far. So I think it was probably some kind of bird. Yeah, at first I thought maybe it was that lynx we were talking about. Kind of doing their little growly meow, but it, it wasn't quite... Yeah. did have more of a bird-like sound to yeah. it, but it was creepy. It was definitely creepy. <laughs> I mean, whatever you want to do during this week, but I'm up for hiking up higher if we want to oh, do yeah. any kind of calling or singing or anything. Yeah, we could definitely we do it. Hi, right, Rebecca. So you've been out here now for a few hours. You've gotten a chance to see kind of layout. What do you think of the area so far? I mean, first impressions and thoughts. It's uh, breathtakingly beautiful. It's wild and I can't I can't uh, see why something couldn't stay hidden in this area I've seen this place on film so it felt familiar but because it's in real life it just it felt surreal <laughs> didn't feel it didn't feel right at the same time it's really exciting to actually be here And actually hear some of the sounds and hear that that's yeah. a that's a seal So another day out here, it's overcast today, not very rainy, which is nice. 
cold. We've got some mountain views coming through. Uh, we've had Rebecca here since yesterday. We got in last night. Not a whole lot. We we're kind of tired, but we did go up to the upper fire pit a little bit. Now we've just kind of been hanging out. I've got a little sick, got a little cold or something, <clears throat> a little bit of a cough. So we're kind of taking it easy today. Maybe we'll go up to the hill up there, beans later, and just kind of check things out. A little puncture right there. So what are we looking at here? So I found this earlier today. There has been storms going on so this got washed up. Didn't quite know what it was. Tried looking it up online. Beans actually, because uh, we were both looking it up and he found mermaid's purse. And huh. so I started looking into it more and sharks, stingrays, and scapes actually this is how they protect their eggs. I'm not getting a good thing behind I here. I think there's a second. Uh, let me see the flashlight for a second. There may be. But this is what they. Okay, this is the bright Protect setting. their eggs with a little egg case. Oh wow, that's pretty. cool. And it's really rare to find them, and it's yeah, rare to find them intact. There's liquid in there, but in I'm not area. seeing. Some I'm not embryo. seeing anything in there. I'm is actually that, concerned. Is that <sighs> I'm like kind of concerned that it's broken back here yeah, a little bit. Probably because it's really rare, apparently, to find them intact. It's punctured. No, oh, it is punctured. But I'm going to put it back in the water anyway, because I want to cool. make sure <coughs> if there is anything in it. That's pretty awesome. But yeah, it's not the rare animal we were looking for, but... <laughs> it's not a Sasquatch, but <laughs> yeah. this location has a lot of stuff. Just send it off into the water. Yeah, just watch your step there. It might be slippery. Unless I know it's right, right. There is a big contrast from the shoreline to the nearby ocean, but together it creates a rich habitat for a variety of species. During our first week on location, while we had not witnessed much in the way of wildlife with the thermal drone, the fact that the Sitka black-tailed deer were seen speaks to the presence of a potential prey species. While out here last year, the only undulate we witnessed from a distance were mountain goats, which we already knew were present based off of game trails up in the mountains we had hiked on. We never saw any of the Sitka deer or moose either, but we did find evidence of moose tracks while exploring a bay attempting to get to a glacier. So those are some potential food sources for a predator. When it comes to larger predators and scavengers, we witnessed evidence of quite a few. Last year we saw a number of black bears feeding up on a hill above us, in the same area as the moose tracks. We also came upon fresh black bear tracks in the snow while hiking up the mountain behind the cabin. As for brown bears, we knew they were around, with Scott having a possible sighting up on a mountainside while we were in the boat. It would have been fascinating to see some from a distance. But brown bears are definitely something that makes us wary and cautious each time while in the forest. Last year we had also discovered possible lynx prints near our camp on the ridge. This was preceded by audio from the night before of what sounds to me like a lynx. With lynx being the only large feline in Alaska, it seemed like a likely possibility. As for the wildlife, these are just a few examples of what is found terrestrially here. As we just showed with the video of the skate egg that Rebecca had discovered, the marine life in this area is extremely rich as well. Between last year's expedition and this current trip, we have witnessed so much of the sea life found in Alaska's coastal waters. Between the large and majestic humpback whales, to orcas swimming about and feeding, to the many seals, sea lions, as well as sea otters. The plentiful nature and large variety of fish here is also remarkable, between the halibut, various salmon species, rockfish, and much more. With this environment hosting so many incredible animals, this is a reason that is not far-fetched, in my eyes at least, 
for something like a Sasquatch to reside in these areas relatively undetected and undisturbed. Moreover, Area A is a microcosm of a wider habitat. Spanning over 2,500 miles of coastline, the Pacific temperate rainforests span from Northern California through the American Pacific Northwest into coastal British Columbia, the Alaskan Panhandle, and across the Kenai Peninsula and towards Kodiak Island, Alaska. While overall they share very similar traits from south to north, there are some differences in plant life. At the very southern tip of these Pacific temperate rainforests lie the majestic redwoods, while further north into Oregon and Washington, coastal Douglas fir trees play a large role in the habitat, stretching into British Columbia. The southeastern Alaskan rainforests are filled with Sitka spruce, western hemlock, red cedar, and shore lodgepole pine trees, while the ones surrounding us here at Area A are more of a Sitka spruce and mountain hemlock dominated forest. For one reason or another, it is these temperate rainforests that have produced so much of the Sasquatch lore and legend over the centuries, between the indigenous stories of old to more contemporary ones. Perhaps it is because much of this vast area is still extremely remote and frontier-like, especially in the Canadian and Alaskan portions, such as the forests we find ourselves in. Or perhaps it has to do with the high precipitation levels, as some have theorized would be necessary for a primate-like creature to survive in. These are not new theories at all, but looking around at this environment, it does seem to just make sense when you've been on location or to a similar place, of which there are thousands of across this vast Pacific coastline. Um, so, you know, you, you've heard about this place before. You've obviously seen our videos. You're now, you've been out here like 24 hours or so. Heard some of the stories. What were your kind of impressions going in just about the whole area in general before you came here, I suppose? Well, thankfully I had a little bit of an idea what it would look like after you did the films. So that kind of prepared me, I thought, for what I was going to see and experience here. But just, gosh, has it only been 24 hours, <laughs> practically. It hasn't been that long. And I've been, I'm looking at the mountains right now, and I'm blown away that this is, this is here. I, I don't think the films prepared me for how beautiful and rugged and remote it is. And just, it's I kept saying breathtaking earlier, but beautiful country, the wildlife just that I've seen since being here, I, things that I've wanted to see my whole life, never knew if I'd ever get up this way and just, I'm just thrilled. Had an otter taunting me right before we <laughs> were filming this. I was uh, yeah. stalking him earlier and he keeps getting away from me, but He'll keep playing the sea game. Otter, it's, yeah. It's fun for him. <laughs> Got um, the seal on. Uh, yeah. So, you know, you guys have done a lot of stuff with the Olympic Project, the nest site, and, you know, you and Chris go down to areas in um, kind of closer to you in the Mount St. Helens area and that mm -hmm. kind of Skamania County right in that area. Um, Cowlitz and Lewis County area, yeah, so in Skamania. You've heard some of the stories from this location. I mean, does it parallel any of the stuff in your experience with like other Bigfoot cases that you heard just kind of behavior and that sort of thing? Or what, what are your thoughts on that? Well, just from what I've heard from here, a lot of it matches a lot of stories in general. Just the, what's the perceived aggression when humans come into an area that hasn't been inhabited, uh, rock throwing vocals and, and just that. I think, I think it's just natural. It's hard to pick similarities of behaviors specifically. I guess I'm saying it, you, you hear something and you go, oh, that sounds like this or it sounds like that story I've heard. And I feel like this place, there's, there's a lot of little things that kind of add up to where you can say, well, we don't have footage, it's a Bigfoot, but it, it follows the path of what could be Bigfoot activity. And the interest, I, I find the rocks really interesting, like the rocks being thrown in the boat, because there's really not anything else that we know of that's going to be doing that. And uh, your, the stellar jays are bigger out here, but I don't think they're doing it. Well, I'm hoping 
just being the, uh, well, I guess I'm the female presence here <laughs> this trip. Um, just hoping that in general. Um, I don't know whether that means just my voice being different or smell or, you know, it not just being the guys peeing everywhere. Um, but I'd like to try out some singing in some different areas, see if maybe that'll bounce around a little bit or just draw some interest. You know, nothing fancy, just see if, just kind of change things up a little bit. See if that brings anything in you guys can film. Yeah, I mean, hopefully we're all obviously looking for answers, right? I mean, yeah. It's been very quiet so far this week, but, you know, it has just been a bunch of us here. Um, and then, what do you have any other goals aside from just, like, the Bigfoot stuff out here? Just in terms oh, of out here? The wildlife, you're big on that. You brought, like, a bunch of field guides. Yeah, I, uh, that's what's funny is if it wasn't Bigfoot, I, I would be, if I'd had the opportunity to do this, I'm, I'm thrilled I got the opportunity to be here. It's funny because Bigfoot is a big part of my life because of, I mean, everything we do, everyone I'm around, and, but if this wasn't a Bigfoot trip, I think I'd still be, I, well, I mean, I would still be, you know, just bopping around here, trying to film things and looking at things. I was picking up shells and little mussels and things down there. I'm just, I'm the, the odd nature nerd, so <laughs> I would just be doing this anyway. I really want to... Um, I don't know, just experience it and take in all I can and film as much of it. I don't know if that's making any sense. I'm normally no, behind a camera. And no, it's all good. <laughs> anything so else you want to add or anything else you want to say? Really encouraged to see some of God's creation. That's how he left it. <laughs> it's beautiful out here. I'm just, just really grateful to be here. Currently making my way back up to the upper fire pit. Wish I could demonstrate how how dark it is, but it's also somewhat light. I mean, it's a very dusk-like darkness. I can walk without a flashlight with fair fair ease, but look up into the trees and you see a bunch of blobs and shapes and stuff like that. Very ominous kind of feeling. One of our more startling experiences from last year here at the upper fire pit. And indeed, one of the reasons I liked to hang out up there was when in the middle of conversing randomly around the fire, we were interrupted by some very prominent wood knocks and what sounded like rocks being thrown into the water and hitting objects on the way down. Whoa, whoa, whoa. We've rehashed and retold the incident in detail in previous videos, so I'll focus on a different angle about the incident. What struck me about the actual sounds of the knocks was how similar it sounded to a Latin percussion jam block instrument. This is something that has been reported at Area A previously, with Scott telling us to only use an actual jam block to attempt wood knocks, likely due to the similarity in sound. So, so then, do we at any point during the night want to attempt doing any wood knocks? That's a question. If we, absolutely. Only let, with let's, what he has, okay? Sure. With the gaff in and that, because so I told you about the we'll Latin block. The yeah. block? Yeah, so but yeah, we'll try that as well. Yeah. So, uh, we have the, the wooden get handle gaff, and if you hit the handles together, it sort of makes a different sound. I don't know what's different about it, but whatever's different about it seems to make them more... Reactive sure. to. Here's the sound of that jam block instrument. Now, here's a comparison between the knocks we recorded and the jam block. Oh, 
The similarity seems to be somewhat intriguing. Without getting into the variety of theories about wood knocking itself, it makes me wonder how in such a constantly wet and mossy environment, where finding a good stick or even rock to attempt a knock with are tough to find, just how something could mimic such a sound. That however is not a question we have the answer to at the moment, as we are not even sure of the origins of those knocking sounds. That's the thing out here, it's like doing gifts or food, it's just sketchy because you don't have a bear, God forbid a brown bear, get interested in that and it screws things up. Is a bird going off? Did you hear that? Yeah, it's, it's like down there. It sounded like rocks. Well, we called and no answer, and we knocked and yep. no answer, so... <laughs> Nobody's home, huh? Or they're just like, oh, we're not giving in. Not that easily. Can't say we didn't try. We have better attempts than this, but at least we got out here. <coughs> it's early in the week, too. Yeah. All I'm thinking about now is warm bed. Unless someone wants to startle us on the way down. Yeah. Looks so cool. Well, I think we can call it.
I don't know what killed us. Bacon's a good way to die. Side for the birds get it. Eggs are done. On this day, I started to feel a little more sick. Initially having a cough the day before, but it seemed to get a little worse overnight. Despite this, I still wanted to make the most of our time out there. So we opted to go for a hike on our side of the bay, in order to survey the area and look for anything interesting. Weird. Pointing. Yeah. I mean, I noticed it from back here. So I'm like, well, that's kind of weird. But that's one of the things that's also kind of suspect about it is it's so obvious. Yeah. You put the camera up past it? The camera is right across from it. Mm hmm. All right, cool. Yep. That's weird. It's kind of strange, huh? There's a big break next to it, too. A little bit weird. It's like a P or an R. And you got whatever this is over here. Just another break. I mean, it could be totally natural. There's no twists. These are all clean breaks. Yeah. The weird thing about that one is you've got that the top of that branch going backwards at that weird angle. Yeah, that's... You know, it's, I mean, it's weird enough to just say, huh, but. This one, though, it's bent. Well. Do you hear that? Yeah. Is that what you heard? No. I heard like an engine sound. That's not like a bird. That one is bent too, right? For new. Yeah. It came up over there. Man, it could be anything. Hear that? Yeah. yeah. Could that be him's cabin? That was up there. Oh, I thought it sounded like it came from down there. See, the acoustics are weird here. Hold on. Could that have been John? He said he was going to do. I think that's John. Because it definitely sounded like it came yeah. from down there. To me, it sounded like it was up there. That's funny because. It's that way. So when it comes up, it bounces off and it hits That's the problem with this place, yeah. Well, you never know. I mean, what if we get back there and John's like, yeah, I decided not to leave the cabin. I've been taking a nap since you... <laughs> Actually, I saw him walk out on the porch as we were coming. I saw him through the, uh, the bunker window. Walk out I can the... always check on the walkie with him. Okay, hey, John, do you copy? Repeat, John, do you copy? Yeah, he's not answering. He's probably outside. Mm. Well, that's fine. That's all right. See here, you've got more weird kind of stuff. You guys haven't been up. See that? Yeah, that's pretty large. Kind of weird. No, we. I mean, I'm. I'm pretty sure we would be the only people that hiked up here last year. 
we've, we found tons of stuff like this that was just little probably deer and goat too because the goats will come down here they found goat tracks in the snow outside the cabin before Yeah, we were talking about the other day, the differences between here and the nest site. How there's that ravine with those, those fingers and that's where the nests were. The geography here is just different, so there isn't really that, that kind of, uh, those ability for those ravines and fingers. So up here it's all just so, just go straight up from the sea. You don't really have much flat. Has that been factored in that there could be less activity because if there's a breeding population, maybe they've moved to a better area for birthing? I don't know. Because this is pretty uh Well, the, prob sketchy. the problem is, it's like different years, like there's been activity in May. There's been acti careful, yeah. <laughs> activity in June. There's been activity in okay. June, like all, yeah. all summer long. Yeah, even the early and the later parts of the year. And then there just won't be anything. So it's like, I don't know if there's really much of a pattern that can be established. Because they could literally just move two bays over and have all the same resources they have here. Maybe they're following I, the deer. I think, I'm starting to think they just make a circuit. And sometimes they just happen to be here when we're here. And sometimes they're not. I don't know if they're after the deer or something else. Because, yeah, I think I agree that the, the novelty or the, the aggression towards the cabin seems to largely have subsided after the first few years. They don't seem that that is much of a threat anymore. So they've adapted their behavior. So they're not as actively... Before it was like they would come here and like mess with stuff, right? Yeah. They would mess with Scott. They would mess with people using logging equipment. And that's the case in a lot of places where you have reports of logging and then activity going on at the edges of those kind of logged well, out the first, areas. The first year I got here, like one of the first things... I mean, like we were off the... You know, we got the, had the boat unloaded and Scott's like... All right, I'm gonna fire up the chainsaw. This always gets him riled up, and he he's cutting you know wood, and you know he's like, now just wait, and nothing happened. Yeah, because the first year I came out here, not really much happened. So you just can't predict it. It's just so unpredictable. And honestly, since since I start since I've been coming out here, like I mean, we've had stuff happen for sure, but like not like not like it used to be. Yeah. A pile of scat now. I thought this was a little den. It's just a rock underneath a stump. There's a little trail up too down here. Yeah, there's nothing. I thought it was scat. It just looks like bark. It's kind of burnt. burnt. Den around here. Looks like this was a kill site. We got a lot of Holy. porcupine quills in here. Yeah. <laughs> Look at all that. No Lots of hair. He said. Yeah, Beans, you said you found scat up here? Yeah, so just on the other side of this log, uh, okay. over there, there's some hairy scat. Looks I'll like predator up. scat. Am I stepping on it? Where no, I? it's like... Hold on a second. I must have missed it. Oh, I see it, I see it. It's right here. Yeah, 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 you're right. Yep, right here. Yeah, look at that. Yeah, so we've got some scat. Could be lynx. So he was maybe eating a porcupine. So it's not a bad place for a cat to hang out. We do have lynx audio from last year, so he found some bones too. Yeah. Be cool to find some skull or something, but I imagine the rodents probably made off with all of it. Yeah, that just goes to show how nothing lasts much in these environments. Critter wise. Found uh, a game trail over here. Yeah. Yep. Oh, what a, yeah, there's definitely one. Uh, breaks along the way here. Yeah. Oh, is this old marker? Oh, what? Old marker. It's like a, looks like a four by four. Old marker? Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah, look at that. 
Don't get a spil splinter. Yeah, I didn't want to touch the metal part. Oh, yeah, look at that. This is on the ground. Actually, there's writing in here. I saw it shiny from wow. over there. I saw some on the other side of the bay. I don't know if I want to say the name out loud just in case. Yeah, Interesting. it was just la it was laying downhill from here, right so it came from that. Must yep, be. so it looks like nobody's really been here in a while. We'll see how close we can get this to the... That is definitely intriguing because that is, I mean... Look how it, look how look. it flexes around. See yeah, how right it flexes there. around the, the log? See here? It yep. continues on yeah. through here. Well, look at there too. There's another one. Let's see if there are any hairs or anything in here. Yeah. That's an interesting impression though because yeah, it, it really is. It's long. It's about it's, it's longer than my foot, and it curls around yep. to the front of the log there and pushes the moss down. And then we've got this confluence of like weird fallen stuff limbs that all like meet in this like jumble. Well, see, look at where my impression just was right there. Comparing it to that. Yeah. I mean, this looks like it's w worn. I mean, you've got one, two right next to each other. So, yeah. what to make of it? And this is this is the hill above, above the outhouse, kind of. Again, huh? Both sides. Both sides. Because I think it wouldn't if it's bear. It'd be up. So, well, it depends on the size of the bear. But see, we've got this curious like shaven area off this tree here on both sides and the That's same the second thing, time yeah the same thing down there and there's another one down bet you there. we'd find another one yeah little trail marker is there any chance somebody could have whacked them hmm. like a human not Maybe. I mean, it's not impossible. Yeah, it's definitely here. definitely possible. But yeah, look at this too. This is worn. This whole thing is worn. You can see crossings here, and I can't even get on that. It's kind of slippery. A lot of lot of well, a lot of use right here. Look at this little jumble in here, and there's like definitely where stuff has been crossing. Through the forest like a cat. Yep, both sides. Again. That's uh it's pretty curious. And it's not I mean there's not like defined claw marks. It doesn't it's very smooth. So I found this right here. Yeah. But the bark yep. has been removed on both sides all the way down this trail. And it looks like maybe there's some more down there. Yeah, there is. There is. It's like a crude trail marker. Yeah. yeah, here you go. Look at this. I mean, this is not old. But yeah, look at this. This almost looks like a little chop. But here's the thing. I feel like it's too clean to be an animal. Look at that. That's, that's like one... That is right where that came from. So you got boom. So this was just... Yeah. Right here, and if there's, looks like a machete or something. Yep. there's a small one on this side. I'd say machete or axe. But this is recent because I, I'm just able to find. There's a little bit of sap coming out of some of them too, so it's not super old. <laughs> That's weird though. Maybe somebody was going to be surveying out here. Anyway. That evening we decided to take the bigger boat out to venture into other bays and inlets in the surrounding area. Perhaps much of the wildlife have moved into areas such as neighboring bays, and maybe the Sasquatch follow. With Damon having left, we lost the skills he brought to the table with his thermal drone piloting abilities, so we were hoping to focus more on cruising the shoreline to survey these areas from the boat.
Looking into these areas really exemplifies the scale of this rainforest frontier. A feeling of human insignificance intensifies in the face of these rugged places, many of which likely haven't been traversed by human beings in quite some time. In the areas we did notice some former human presence. It was always close to the shore and near the water. You would not expect to find any human habitat high up in the exposed meadows, thousands of feet above sea level. This seems to strictly be the domain of the creatures that call it home. It is here that we as humans are truly the outsider, unable to tame such a wild place. This is the true allure of the Sasquatch, a creature that is in harmony with this epic wilderness, a romantic idea to countless people, thus the appeal of this topic in many ways. Whether or not there is a reality behind such a myth, it certainly is something that won't go away anytime soon. After that boat ride, whatever bug I had picked up was starting to get worse, and as a result, instead of heading out into the rain for another night out, I opted to stay inside to enjoy the comfort of the cabin in order to rest up. While it felt like a wasted opportunity in the moment, there was no reason for me to risk getting even more sick, especially when in such a remote location. These past few days were relatively quiet. And as we branched out further, we saw the vastness of the area we were in and the challenges this presents. On the next episode of Dark Coast, we continue the investigation for the last few days of the two-week journey, dealing with sickness as well as anything else that comes up. <laughs>